a fascinating map of his social, economic, and political values. A second type of imitation involves dancing, a pastime like that engaged in during the maidens and different holy days of the year by contemporary nobles and civic leaders whose associational ties to the city permitted the benefit of dance and other holiday recreational pleasures. Much of this kind of mimicking engaged in by Turpin occurs as the result of other circumstances, either at bridals he attends where he's set to sing in public, or in the street during the time of the riding and cheap, down one of the major streets somewhere between the great condo and St. Paul churchyard. Perkins lavishing upon others of the money he has in hand from the shop for gambling introduces, as Bob also has, yet another kind of associational mimicry pursued by the apprentice. If the ambiguity of the lines describing this act of generosity and piety is not meant to carry a vague suggestion of immoral purposes, as A.C. Spearing once suggested, but invites understanding that Perkins spending time with a woman rather than a prostitute his being trailed is despised, offers at least enough information to call attention to a readiness on his part not to keep his money private or to himself, but to spend it in imitation of associational largesse, mimicking by means of a kind of mean street gentillesse, like acts of generosity demonstrated at times in the not too distant past by members of the mayoral oligarchy who, in the course of maintaining the great city's civic order, aspire to be as magnanimous as their royal betters. As the tree from which the apple falls is rarely far from where the apple lands, so it is with Perkins' master that he, too, is presented in hog's tail as embodying the inability to act intelligently in regard to the professional responsibilities with which he has been tasked as a proprietor of the bookshop. Now, the brief account of this character, as well as the brief action he appears to engage in regarding Perkins, indicates he is an individual who is fairly well off and who, like Hogg, is a contributing member to London's civic order by being a competitor in the same trade. Information given about him in the text through the report of punitive action raises doubt about whether this particular member of the victorious fraternity is above reproach. And Dennis Biggins made this point about half a century ago. Further doubt about this particular food trades master is also suggested by a report of other putative action. However expedient Perkins' act of poems might appear to be when it is finally executed, the probable fact of its constituting an improper dismissal reveals it may be a blunder like two previous ones, implicitly committed by the same master. The first of these blunders suggested by the narrative uh, is the way in which it appears he has run the bookshop. What can be inferred from the report of putative action here is that much of the time this master victory was not even in the shop during the work hours. Or if he was, that much of the time he was there, he was doing something other than running the business, since he was not even in place to keep an eye on the shop strongly. The suggestion of lax oversight, the report of putative action, introducing Perkins' <coughs> inability to impose order and demand conformity to the basic rule for action in the commercial setting, first by separating rebel from truth, next by keeping rebel and the inevitable consequences of riot and theft out of doors, and last by maintaining the proper father-son relationship with the apprentices, also appears to have led to the emergence in the shop over time of an atmosphere way of doing things, inimical to trust and unanimity of purpose. That all working in this place of business had not been of one mind and dedicated to the shop's uh, principal goal of winning it in return for offering a number of food trade services is implied as Bob suggests, not only by the fact that Perkins had to deceive Wolf and Bay, but also by the fact that Perkins had once been let off the Newgate prison at the head of a Hogg's thorough familiarity with the Drop of London Arm, which Muriel Bowden suggested half a century ago, is a feature of his neighbor and bad living, and not evidence of a distinct ability as an eye 
might seem the logical final trump from the lower orders to touch upon, since much critical energy was spent last century on the implications of Hobbes taking and drinking from the proper in the mass of his prologue. The trouble from the lower orders that the moon represents may introduce a much greater threat to civic order than public drunkenness, a threat much like the blemish of leprosy turns out to be for the mayoral oligarchy, as the letter books from the latter half of the 14th century amply demonstrate. Chaucer's singling out of the mormon is by no means a way of advocating for something resembling a public health policy, but he seems to understand that the condition resulting from or associated with a suppurating lesion like the mormon is a subject to be given serious consideration for one thing, it may very well explain in the Mansible prologue why Hobbes says, when called upon by Harry Barron, that he would prefer a place to sleep rather than the disguised being in the Thank you. showing a brief examination of the marginalia aspect of the research I am doing for my dissertation on English histories during the shift from manuscript to print that begins in 1480 with William Caxton's Chronicles of England up to the English Civil War, which begins in 1642. Early modern printed histories have been used in three different ways. First, they've been subsumed as pieces of evidence in other historical studies, or secondly, receiving the full spotlight in a genre study. However, those genre studies normally are only the length of a book chapter or a journal, journal article. Finally, and most damagingly, many of these histories have been dismissed as unimportant or poor historical writings, as seen in Daniel Wolfe's article, Genre into Artifact, in which he specifically labeled them as soon out of date, given their scissors and paste method of compilation. While the authors of those early modern histories openly admitted their efforts to be compilations, it was with the aim to correct errors in older sources and to provide a single, cheaper object for others to be able to find this information within rather than having to go seek out the primary, uh, rare medieval sources themselves. Modern dismissal of these printed histories as too likely to report strange events, you know, do long lists of London mayors, and repeat material from earlier histories in every edition. It's roughly the same thing, except it adds a few every time you know, a few years pass. It's kind of like your textbook. Um, just another way to make you buy it again. It is anachronistic to, as it expects early modern works to meet modern historical methods and form, rather than seeing how contemporaries valued these works just as they were. And they were evolving slowly, though, over time. Admittedly, even some early modern writers dislike these chronicles, as seen here by these statements from John Donne, Thomas Nash, and Edward Littleton. It is the other voices, though, not those of famous um, early modern people, which I wish to recapture by examining such things as what the users noted, how they noted it, and which authors or printers' works received the most interaction, because some of these chronicles are not. Marginalia is the special term used to denote the notations left by users in the margins of a book. But I'm also considering non-textual marks as well, such as underlining, uh, little flags written in the margins, check marks, uh, manicules, which is another fancy academic term for basically a finger pointing at a word, doodles, drawings, writing on the fly leaves, which are the blank pages in the front and back of a book, uh, different writing practices, you know, they'll practice their alphabet on a random page, ownership 
authorship marks and other evidence that readers and users, users provided in these books. Some scholars, um, such as the readership and reception chapter that Felicity Heal has provided in the 2013 Oxford Handbook to College Ships Chronicles, they've stated that only a small minority of surviving texts are extensively marked. And Heal herself found only 11 copies of Holland Shift's Chronicles with varying amounts of annotation. However, she did limit her search to archives in England. William Sherman, in used books, argued that 20% of the 7,500 short title catalog items at the Huntington and short title catalog items date from 1475 to 1640. He said 20% had marginalia, which would be closer to supporting Heal's number. Yet, Heidi Hackle, in her study, Reading Material in Early Modern England, said that 70% of the 151 extant copy, co copies of Sydney's Arcadia that she examined had managed to have at least some level of annotation in them. It needs to be kept in mind that Sherman also stated 